I'd like a uh, real pleasure to introduce James Rosie, uh, British Army um, with the Intelligence Corps for seven years, including two deployments in Afghanistan and placement in British Embassy in China. He joined DSTL uh, for the last nine years, um, included three years in the Joint Forces Command and another two deployments in Afghanistan, providing social science advice to the military commanders, which he was awarded an MBE. Um, James is talking twice. <laughs> I'm af afraid I've forced him to do that. Speaking again tomorrow, right? Um, so it's a real pleasure to have him, and uh, Chris is the perfect person who writes on similar issues to chair the session. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, and it's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here. Um, just to sort of flesh out what Chris has already said, my background was as a military intelligence analyst, and throughout the common theme has really been working on human terrain issues, problems of identity, um, especially in those early days of Afghanistan, as whoever tribes were those drivers to conflict. And then as I returned, it was looking at reconciliation um, and reintegration of Taliban fighters. And in DSTL, um, that our UK MOD's Defence Science Technology Laboratory, that's really been my key focus as well. Um, in the last year, I've been working on something called behaviour analytics. So I've been given the opportunity to really sort of deep dive into a technical area, shape it as I want to see fit. Um, so without much more ado, I'll just jump onto the slide. The first thing is that wonderful quote there by Bertrand Russell. Um, science is dealing with the, so science is what you know, <coughs> science is what you don't know. I think that really kind of encapsulates as well that difference between design and planning. <coughs> and when we're dealing with those unknowns, it's philosophy that's really helped me in my career so far. Two more things I just want to quote. Um, I've heard philosophy is unintelligible words to describe insoluble problems. And equally, philosophy is common sense with large words. And I would disagree with both of those. I think at the moment we're facing a lot of defence problems. Some of those may be soluble, some of them may not be. But the role of philosophy and this type of thinking is to make it meaningful, graspable <laughs> to military decision planners, strategic planners, or designers. Um, so they understand what it is we're trying to do and can actually function better and make better decisions. So to actually link it to something real as well, so I've been working on behavioural analytics for the past year and it's been a team effort. I think people might be quite pleased to know this wasn't any particular problem set we were given. Somebody saw there's a huge emerging problem, well, emerging opportunity here. Data science is coming, human science is coming. How can we bring those together and make it something really meaningful? So we were driven by opportunity, not by threat, um, which brought its own challenges. When something so broad as this, how did we decide how to bound it, how to define it, and move forward and keep it something that we could grasp as a small team with our, as people said, trying to bore the ocean or go completely off piste into our own little rabbit holes of our own independent research issues. The other point I point out is I'm kind of applying this thought, these philosophical terms with hindsight. Um, I did not sit down at the outset of this process and go, right, first I need ontology, then I need epistemology, then I need design. Um, I went through what seemed like common sense to me through discussions with the team, and then I looked back and thought, well, actually, this is where I use my thinking as ontology, this is where epistemology comes in, how do we know things? Obviously, as an intelligence analyst, I've got a real interest in epistemology. How do I know what I know? Where are the gaps? How do I fill those gaps? And that side of it. <coughs> so that bias might come out. So the point of this is not to say these are the answers, this is the way to do it. This is to engender discussion. Please feel free to criticise. I'm still learning, especially learning about design. This is active work that's going. I'm constantly trying to turn the handle. Somebody mentioned earlier about it always being a leap. I think it needs to be a leap because at some point we've got to stop, we've got to reflect and move forward. So loops, spirals, something like that. But it's definitely not a linear process where we just sit our left and right of arc and move on. Um, and finally, the key things in any capability, and especially this one, and especially in these processes, are accountability, transparency, and responsibility. Um, it's been clear why we're doing things, what we're doing, and how we're going to use that to drive it forward. So my next slide, I apologize, it's a lot of words. I was told not to. But it's a definition that we were given, or that we've been working with, and I'm going to use that as a concept or a framework to hang hooks on elsewhere so I can say why ontology means something to me and the work we've been doing, why epistemology does. 
I think at this point the key word is predict. Um, we're not trying to, we are trying to understand the problem, but understanding is great. What's really, really important is that prediction. What comes next so we can plan an intervention, so we can manage a risk, mitigate a risk. And again, <coughs> it comes back to the idea, there's an opportunity here to make better decisions. These are the decisions that are coming towards us. They're not the ones we're facing here and now in quite the same way as some other military problems, defence problems might present themselves. And again, for the sake of repetition, this is not done as a process. This is not meant to be prescriptive. And there's really good, strong, clear reasons for that. You end up with a process, you end up with something like this. Um, you've got no context in which to employ your thinking. You just go through the steps by rote. <laughs> and at one point, you're going to hit a black box. And if you don't listen to that black, black box, it might as well be a miracle. Um, so when it works, it's absolutely fine. And we discussed yesterday, a lot of these processes, these lists, they work perfectly for the last war, for the last situation, <coughs> for the last problem you try to solve. If for some reason your checklist then doesn't work, and you don't understand why that checklist exists in the way it does, you've got a real problem there. Um, a really good example of that would be, from a few years ago, the flight landing on the Hudson River of Captain Sully, uh, 1549. He had a checklist. At the bottom of his checklist was seal the hatches and the windows for water. Not massively helpful, he had about a quarter of his checklist to go through in the time available. So if he'd followed that checklist, which worked perfectly in training, a lot of people may have died. So by thinking about these things and not tying yourself to that one set of processes, you've got that flexibility to think, to adapt to the situation. And again, that's really what we've tried to do um, with this. It's an open methodology. It's an it's gearing ourselves up to take those challenges those problems, as they come in so we can grab them, turn them around, throw them back. It's not a specific, this is the way it must be, this is fixed. And the other really important thing about this definition is it's probably not right. It's a working definition. We made the conscious decision as we reached out across government, across industry, across academia, that the most important thing was to have some common understanding and agreement on what we were trying to do so we can have meaningful conversations without getting wrapped up in language, not to spend a year jamming every little thing, weighing every bit of evidence, and then saying, great, we've got something that's 90% of what we said a year ago. And we just decided it wasn't worth that investment of effort. <coughs> so as an antidote to a checklist, um, I assume most people here know Richard Feynman is, particle physicist, um, famous for his teaching and work on the Manhattan Project. Um, he never actually gave this as his problem solving algorithm. Somebody else described that as the way he approached problems. Um, and I think it's ideal. It's got the three key elements. It's got a problem, what are you trying to do, what are you trying to address. You sit down and you think about it. That's all the detail you need, and then you've got an answer. And they're absolutely all critical. There's no point in having an answer if you've not got a problem. Of the situations where it's not a problem and answer situation, but you've got to think about it. You can't just run it through a machine and expect something to come out that's what you need. And also, it's in order. If you start with an answer, and a lot of people in defence, especially defence procurement, they like starting with answers. Often the answer is, it needs to be painted black, I want daggers on it, and it's got to look really, really cool. And then they can work back and they can give you the requirement about why they have to buy that piece of kit. So having this just in my mind at all times is, spend that time thinking, conceptualise what it is I'm trying to do, and it has to be tied to something, otherwise, I'm just doing it for my own entertainment, which is great, but maybe not the best use of taxpayer money. So, why philosophy? Um, and here I have confessed, this is my personal bias. Um, as an undergraduate, I first studied philosophy. I absolutely loved it. Um, it did underpin everything I did in intelligence analysis. It was that conceptual thought, that critical thought, but also jumping across different subjects, from logic to aesthetics to metaphysics. So in that way, it's not just an approach, it's not a toolkit, preparing me to think about different problems in different ways. Um, if I'd gone down STEM, math, science, engineering, this would be a very different talk, I probably wouldn't even be here. Um, so again, this is the context, this is my bias for all of this, of why I'm here speaking in this way. And it helps me focus on questions, not answers. The right question is the most critical thing you can do when you're approaching any kind of design problem, planning problem, or solution. Or solution. 
Um, and then the final caveat before I go forward is I'm going to talk about epistemology ontology, which is all very much Western analytical philosophy. Um, but I'm not one to say that's better than other types. There's other flavours of Western philosophy. There is continental philosophy, existentialism. We spoke about Eastern philosophy taking that holistic viewpoint. I think there is very aesthetics, theory of language. I've not used it. It didn't seem quite applicable here. Um, but it's equally relevant and equally informed thinking in this kind of space. But again, to justify then, why philosophy specifically? Um, for me, it's three pillars that I've used here to support my thinking. That's ontology, what exists, what can exist. Epistemology, as I said, how do we know what it is that we know? And I think underpinning all of it is ethics. Um, you have ethics in research, but also we need to consider the ethics of what we're trying to do and how we try to do it. I'm going to break down and explore all of those topics in much more detail earlier. Um, as I went through, I, again, as I've said, I did not go, firstly, the ontology, how can I then know about that ontology? How can I then morally apply it? They're layers, they're mostly self supporting. I can pull at any one of those threads, it would all come down. And the final thing on this slide, sorry, is when we're dealing with morality and ethics is to stress this, it's about necessity and proportionality. There's an awful lot within behavioral analytics that, well, I'm Cambridge Analytica right saying I'm trying to do Cambridge Analytica well. Um, and that's why we set up those principles of transparency, accountability, responsibility, things I'm sure are the antithesis to how they run their operation. But we need, again, to have the expertise to challenge that and it's going to be challenged in an ethical and a moral way. To start with, ontology. And this, for us, if we're trying to analyse something, as you all are, it's critical. It's deciding what it is we include, <coughs> what it is we can analyse, and how, therefore, what world is it we're looking at. Um, it may be an objective world, it may be a subjective world. Uh, and these are real issues to wrestle with. Um, I would shy away from saying there's any objective truths out there um, in this kind of space, but equally, we want something we can measure, something we can quantify and build into it. How we then patch that against a construction, um, social construction, sorry, is a real, I want to say problem, but it's something that we've got to layer upon. Um, and this is why we can't just apply data science to the problem. So it leads us, I mean, how do we then create something that's open enough to just all these challenges, that, that future that we can't anticipate, but yet closed enough that it doesn't become too wide and too broad for us to comprehend? Um, it's a very good philosophical paradox called the paradox of the ravens now, which is all ravens are black, anything I see kind of confirms that. That used to be called the paradox of the swans, all swans are white. Uh, they changed it after they found black swans. You know, their own ontology when creating paradox was trying to the point that it's to throw it out and bring it in. Black swans now means something very different. It means an unexpected disruptive event. Um, so how can we build an ontology that's flexible enough to we can manage, we can bound, but if something does come in from left field, what is it we do to pull it in, manage it without our entire system collapsing around us? So the simplest way to build an ontology, especially dealing with people and behaviours, is us versus them. Um, I'm sure everybody here agrees that's not a good ontology. It's a really bad way of looking at the world. It's oversimplistic. It doesn't really apply. But lots of people use it. And it's a really seductive one. It's a very easy concept to grasp. You get it in some of the more scandalous newspapers. You get it on social media an awful lot. And it's especially easy to do it as a negation. You know? We are a room full of design people, they are not design people. We are military, they are civilian. It's, it can take root, it's probably hardwired into it at some degree, but it is dangerous and it just doesn't really add any cognitive impact. It's just that emotive load. So the most simple characteristic of doing it is my enemy's enemy is my friend. That's not true. And also you just define people as enemies and allies. There's a whole complexity out there which is kind of how you can use that a little bit more. So you could do a spectrum. I have spoken about those earlier. Um, but, you know, friend, foe. And people are on that line somewhere. 
and it's seductive, but the world is more complex than that. We may agree on some things, we may dis disagree on others. You know, and also your spectrum, those different ends, they may not be mutually <coughs> exclusive. Uh, in psychology, a lot of people have conscientiousness and risk. And that's great. They seem, you know, risk takers aren't conscientious, not a problem. But then you get to extreme sports, you get to some elements of military planning. Huge amounts of thought are going into that to plan that, to mitigate against that risk. But at the end of the day, the risk is there, and once they've done that bit, and they think they understand it, they jump straight in. So how, how is that accounted for in a spectrum? Um, it can't be. The other way is you do a taxonomy, so you subdivide and you subsection, and that's great. But the problem with that one, again, you can get overly specific far too quickly. Um, so rather than just going to the general us versus them, it's us, allies of convenience, allies of finance, um, allies in this space. But everybody's different, you know, it's the internet message, everybody's a unique individual. How far down that level of specificity can you go? Or how can, far can you allow yourself to go before you accept everyone's at their own data point and you can't generalise up? And that means you can't generalise for your design, for your planning, for your intent. So it's always got to be a compromise. Um, and this, again, what we try to build into the work we've been doing in behavioural analytics is have as flexible and tolerable as possible and one that we can flex for every problem, specific problem that we're given to answer with that wider capability. So this is a good example of just trying to understand how complex things can be. You can probably see some movement in that depending on the resolution and the frame refresh. But that's just a four colour picture. There's no movement there, but we can see it. So humans are vastly more complex, but infinitely more complex than that. So how do we account for the things that we can see there that may not be there, that may be our interpretation, that may be hardwired culturally or biologically to our way of seeing things? You then have to take that a step out if we're collecting data from the internet, from online sources. And we kind of favour the online sources because they're available. Um, there's volumes of data there, but that's not the only type of behaviour in the world. I appreciate that. So of all the things to get me on, please don't get me on that one. I know it's a limitation. But the way we collect data will also shape and add its own layers of detail. The mechanisms we need to filter and process data will add those biases, those illusions and emergent patterns. So how can we get in, understand them, strip, strip them out if we can, but if we can't, just have that awareness so we can mitigate against it as it comes through. A good example of how I've seen this vary in Afghanistan when I was there was the concept of Afghan meths. I don't know if anybody's heard of this. So you get a, what would normally be a reliable input port, and it'll be one toad of 4x4 came across the border, 20 guys on it with RPGs. And you're thinking, I know how big they are. I know how big 20 guys are. That doesn't make sense. And it was the bane of analysts everywhere trying to work out because it's kind of consistently used. And what they were reporting wasn't how many heads or rifles they could count. What they were reporting, quite honestly and to them objectively, was the threat that they felt. And once you understood that as like that crucial lens, it all kind of made sense. But until you do and you understand, that, again, where those biases are on your collection as well as your interpretation, you're really going to struggle with how you map that onto your ontology, where a number doesn't necessarily mean what you think it does. And again, as I've said, humans are far more complex, there are emotions, there are behaviours that can be interpreted in many ways, mean many different things to different people. Another way of looking at it, I mean, we've always spoken about Afghans, so if I was going to code that into a database so I could then analyse it in terms of behavioural ethics, am I looking at some Afghans? Am I looking at some Pashtuns? Am I looking at tribesmen? Am I looking at tribal elders? Am I looking at friendly forces or allies? Am I looking at farmers growing drugs? Am I looking at insurgents? And some of those aren't mutually exclusive either. But if you're trying to get into a data set so you can do your analysis, <coughs> how do you recall it? Is it just fine, we just do it multiple times? What we've tried to do is rather than put those subjective labels on, and we will probably struggle with this at some point, is it's just behaviours, observable behaviours. So they're just people, which seems self-explanatory. There are people, if we observe them shooting at us, that would infer a particular role they have. We wouldn't label them as Taliban, we wouldn't label them as insurgents. They could just be people we've annoyed. 
because at times the military are very good at causing friction in Afghanistan. If they're involved in drugs, we just say they've been involved in drugs. Right. If they've helped us, they've helped us. There's just no need to apply those labels with the kind of data we're trying to handle. And again, it's that label is something we've not included in ontology, hence the behaviour and behaviour analytics. However, I do realise there's probably going to be significant challenges in that, in that we lose a lot of those shorthand labels that could quickly and usefully convey information or convey meaning. So then we have that challenge of how do we map, how do we map that across so people can understand what we're doing in the most accessible way possible. And I think that's quite well encompassed by this quote attributed to Einstein, but probably not from him. Um, there's lots of things that we can count. Some of those are going to have meaning, some of those aren't. But we have to accept there's lots of things that we really want to understand and know about that we won't be able to directly observe. That may be the role for somebody else using different capabilities, or where possible, we'll use a human scientist supporting this capability to provide that interpretation and that context. So I've spoken about the observed. Um, I, the real danger now we've got is, I talked about prediction earlier, obviously you can't observe the future. So we've got to try and build those patterns, identify those patterns, and then with confidence move from what has happened now to what may happen. And it's not going to be foresight, it's going to be divergent, there will be a range of options. And again, it's the confidence of, will it be option A, option B, option C? And the real, the real challenge, it, what caps this one trying to do here is how can we pull that through so we use got reliable data so we've got that evidence that transparency yeah we've got that scientific rigor that will drive it and provide again that meaning to the decision makers so again back to that definition I've thrown up and I've highlighted where ontologies really come to that come into it obviously some of them come from the human sciences so we come from the data sciences. And what's really apparent there is that's two very different disciplines, that's two very different ways of understanding the world, and it all comes together in behaviours. I mean, if you've got a Venn diagram, that's where the overlap would be. Um, so the approach you've taken actually delivering this, trying to do this in anger, for the first year has really focused on having data scientists and human scientists working together on a single problem set. So they speak one another's language, they know how people um, approach problems, structure problems and break it down. And we were really quite nervous about doing this because for all we know there's going to be absolutely no common ground whatsoever. They would still to interact, their approaches just wouldn't be compatible and we'd have five people in one end of the room, five people at the other end of the room just fighting and arguing about it. Um, thankfully, that didn't happen. Um, that's the credit to the people involved. They really engaged. They made sure they spoke to other teams. They took, an idea, took their ideas on board and spent time, especially at the planning stages of the sprints that we used, understanding how people structured their problems, understanding where they could have benefit, but also where the other person's skill set could have benefit to what they were trying to do. We also, throughout it all, we try to use real-world problems wherever possible. And when you haven't really got a capability that can promise delivery, it's quite hard to get people to give you data and problems to work on. And we were looking at it, we wanted to find it. What this enables to do, we've talked about the virus scenarios. We explicitly wanted to avoid that. This is emergent. We don't know where it's leading. If we did scenarios, no matter our best intentions, we were presupposing the outcomes to some degree we'd be thinking, this is the type of problem that can be answered, let's look at it. And we felt, for what we're trying to do, that's the wrong approach. We just want to basically throw ourselves into the unknown, um, fail fast if that's how it really takes, learn from that, and then turn the handle again. We'll always make it a real-world problem, because we're trying to find the problems, the obstacles, the challenges that we haven't thought about, that we're not going to foresee, because none of us are an expert in all of the fields that are necessary to deliver this. Um, that said, scenarios, ab scenarios absolutely do have their place. Um, it's just not, the not the route that we chose to go down. Um, so move now then to epistemology. Um, 
So Descartes, famously very, very cynical, break it down, stories of evil demons, um, and how can you trust anything that's been collected? A common complaint from intelligence analysts, you know, is this reliable? What's its validity? Where does it come from? And it's the same with the data. I've already spoken, there is bias at every level coming through. How do we strip that out? How do we mitigate against it? Um, but at some point, we've got to draw that line. We're working in a real world. We're working in this world of these are our perceptions. That's great. <coughs> but the challenges we're facing are within that world of perceptions. Um, it's great to say none of it's true. It's all ideas in an academic context, in a very philosophical academic context. But that's the world that we're trying to inform, to work with. Just take that stand and accept some of it is what it is. So I'm not a true philosopher. I just want to apply it. Um, so then, accepting the world around us is there. How do we then manage the uncertainty of all the data? Um, there's a common things. Um, and the point of it is there's no one right answer. You know, for some people it's a duck, it's a rabbit, it's an old woman, it's a young woman. That's absolutely fine. Um, but again, if we're trying to take that, we're trying to code that into a database so we can run um, algorithms, machine learning, AI, AI over it, how do you code it up? Also, what happens if something generally has multiple interpretations? Um, how much trust can you put in the system that you're favoring any one particular frame of looking at it? Um, if it's to do with behavior, how can you frame it, or how can you be sure that your frame is at all accurate? And again, to go back to Afghanistan, if somebody's shooting at us, does that mean they're Taliban? They could be a farmer protecting their crops. They could be just letting off some steam because they've got nothing else to do. Uh, there's actually a multiple number of reasons. Um, or they may not see it as a big deal. It's just a game they're playing. You know, because courageous restraint, we're probably not going to shoot back at them. They get to look big and impressive. But if then we take that and then we categorize them as a Taliban or insurgent, that's going to have some real world consequences. And again, it's that uncertainty as it cascades through that we need to challenge, to push back against. Um, but it does leave us open to the possibility of misinformation deception. For those who know, that's 55, I've got this right, Savaskina Street, um, home of the Russian Internet Research Agency. So you speak of Descartes and his evil demons controlling our perceptions and what we see. It's trolls now, and it's a real risk. Um, and this actually is where epistemology and ontology combine. If we see something, it may be true, it may not be true. But if it's not true, is it just a mistake? Is it a bias? Or is it a deliberate lie? And how do we account for that? I mean, it's another tag we've got to put on. I think this is really important, because again, we're talking about behaviours. The behaviour of saying something that happens to be wrong, because I'm wrong, is very different to me lying to you about something specific. So how do you go back? Again, it's something you can't see, we can't count. But it is accounted for, but it's absolutely crucial to understanding what may happen next and what we could predict. The other challenge in this kind of space with disinformation and misinformation is you can manipulate and deceive with the truth. You omit certain parts, you frame it in such a way, you present it in a certain way. Again, how can you manage that as an observed behavior when you've got a, essentially a fixed ontology that you've coded into a database um, <coughs> in such a way that a human scientist can go, I see how this works, I can try and drive that forward. And then the final one on epistemology is so when you're dealing with uncertainty and what's unknowable. If you take poker, that's where they're in an open system. We know what we know, we may not think we know what you know, but then do you know what we think you know? And it almost comes a pull off and you just, if you're not careful, you're gonna just go too far down and make your life unerringly complex. Um, then potentially no reason, because it could just be they were wrong. Well, that's the other one, um, it's uncertainty. I talked about prediction, but some things are inherently unknowable. You know, you might know the probability, but you don't know what the actual result's going to be. And again, this is where I'd always be wary about some, some forms of scenario planning. Um, at a similar event, I met somebody who tried to persuade me they had a brilliant system for roulette. Now, if it lands on black, 
obviously, next time it's going to be red. And it was obvious then. And my face may have shown some skepticism. And I said, well, you know, how do you know that? I said, I've tested it. It's like, go on. I said, yeah. I've run a thousand iterations of this in my head every time it's worked. <laughs> and it's like, fantastic. But that's the problem, is how do we break up our thinking and account for those things that we don't know, we can't know, um, and then be prepared to receive them and deal with them. So again, epistemology, how we know, the methods of knowing, as much as the knowing of it, is all throughout that definition that we used. We didn't plan it in this way. We applied different methods, different epistemological structures and frameworks from different disciplines um, and trying to bring them together. What we haven't been able to do within this is define our behaviours and define what it is to be observed. Um, that's something that will probably change every time we approach a new problem from a new direction, um, but it's something that we felt would be too complicated to capture in the definition, where, as I said at the start, we're trying to build consensus, have that work in definition and take people forward, not get stuck, and then it becomes paralysis by analysis. So that brings us to the final sort of big section, which is around morality. Um, two very different quotes, two very different outlooks. Um, it's Machiavelli on the left, I'm sure everybody's heard of. Henry Stinson on the right, who famously closed down briefly the US SIGINT um, capability um, in the interwar period. Now, they're two very different extremes. I don't want to endorse either of them. But for anyone who's worked in defense and military, we do need to know what the other person's doing, what the other person's thinking at times. So how can we do this in a moral way? Again, with those principles that I spoke of, behavioral analytics, of transparency, accountability, responsibility, and also proportionality and necessity. So one obvious way of doing that, I think most people implicitly agree that the state now has a knock in violence. And you can kind of trace this thinking back to Thomas Hobbes and Leviathan. So so the quote, the life of man is nasty, beautiful, and short. So the way to mitigate that is to pass that monopoly, that power, onto a state to enforce good behaviours. But what's really important with this is that's not an abrogation of personal responsibility, at least not in the West. That's an active delegation of responsibility uh, to use violence. However, surveillance, collecting of the data that we might use in behavioural ethics, there's far more debate going on there. And some people might think, well, we've delegated that right to violence. Surely the right to surveillance is much less of a big deal. You know, people aren't actively going to be cured by it. Obviously, it informs decisions that may lead that way. But then we look at the renovations from Ed <coughs> Snowden. You see the public outcry. We see what's still going on with the Cambridge Analytica scandal. So actually, it's not a cut and dried case that the state can hold these powers. There's obviously still that understanding of where the morality is, why do people feel so strongly about this, and what, what is the moral and ethical position of the state to do this kind of surveillance, and why do people react against it so badly? And this is one obvious example of why. Um, I assume everyone knows the basic structure of 1984, that ubiquitous police state. Um, that's essentially unrestricted surveillance, mass surveillance, without any transparency, without any accountability, without any responsibility. I mean, that's absolutely not where we want to go. Perhaps that's where people feel we're going because we've not communicated why we're trying to do it. And this is really important for something like behavioural analytics, because as I said, painted wrongly, that could look like something like Cambridge Analytica is trying to do. Um, so we have to be morally and ethically aware, not only how we collect data and what data we put into that machine, or that capability, but also, at the end of that process, how is that capability going to be used and to what ends? Um, we could use it hypothetically to stop all counter-terrorism. All we've got to do is curtail and cancel all civil liberties about um, communication and online freedom of speech. As a personal view, definitely a defence view, to me that's abhorrent. 
I mean, what's the point of destroying what you're trying to protect? It's the quote from the Vietnam War, we have to destroy the village to protect it. This is almost occurring, we have to destroy civilization to protect it. But where that line is drawn is almost a space for public debate. Um, again, this is always you spoke about, Zero Dark Thirty, that manhunt for Osama bin Laden. Okay? This is maybe the kind of thing behavioral ethics could support. You can follow that pattern, you can see those patterns of behavior to pull out that one individual. But what is it that would give us the right to do that, to pull them out, and give us that moral responsibility, that moral force? It could be necessity, we're absolutely fine with that, um, or it could be for the greater good. But we need to understand why it's there, why it is we're making these choices and taking these actions. So, so far, I've spoken in the abstract, and get towards the end, I want to give sort of a tangible example of a different way of looking at morality. So there's normally two different ways of structuring it. There's that rules-based approach, you know, the shall not kill deontology, and then there's the greater good approach, um, utilitarianism, which focuses on consequences. Now, especially in defense, there's challenges with both of those. Thou shalt not kill does not sound like a great mission driver for the defense or the military. So are we operating in terms of exceptions, in which case we've lost our general principles of morality, or are we just saying, guys, you're immoral, which I would not be willing to do. Similarly, utilitarianism has its challenges. How can you understand your consequences? Also, all these decisions are made in a certain context at a certain time. They may be fine at the moment, but 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, it's a different situation. And if you look to the news at the moment, the Chagos Islands, at the time that was probably seen as the right thing to do, the moral decision, now we're looking back, we're seeing the impact of that. It's a very different moral judgment that's been made. So the example I was going to throw up very quickly as an alternative was chivalry, virtue ethics. So the Knights of King Arthur, they're paragons of Christian virtue, Christian values, that includes that shalt not kill. But you know, how does that then coincide with their role in society, which is violence? So they create a new code around them, a new way to put them at different moral status. Now, I'm not suggesting defence, um, surveillance operators, <coughs> or knights, offering or otherwise, but maybe we need to think about the role of people have in society and adapt our moral and ethical frameworks to fit that role, not try and generalise everyone outwards under the same frameworks. <coughs> Boy, I think I'm aware of time, so I'll move quickly. Um, absolutely vital, I think. It was his ideas of how to create so destruction and creation that kind of inspired how I wanted to operate and drive this forward. Um, it was that kind of thinking and also of doing that drove how we did it. So I interpret this statement to be or to do. You can either be part of the hierarchy, part of the structures, or you can do the tasks you've been given. Um, we really focus on trying to do the tasks. Um, and now we're hitting that kind of, some degrees of organisational friction, not deliberately, but simply because they're not set up to operate in this way. Um, yeah, I'm aware of time, so I bring it to a close. But this is a quote that I've always found really useful and really powerful when thinking about things. Um, I'm sure everybody here can take different things away of where they want to play, where they want to apply serious thought. So I will leave it on this. Hopefully you're now ready for questions. Um, uh, before I open it up, uh, you, you, you've covered a lot of ground here. I mean, I, I almost call it meta ground. <laughs> um, uh, I think back on my own experiences. Uh, my professor of military science uh, back in uh, 19, early 1976. Okay, that's old I am. Some of you weren't born yet. Um, he, his name is uh, Stuart Harrington. I don't know if anybody's ever read any of his stuff, but uh, he was a captain at the time. And he came to be the assistant uh, professor of military science to my school. And he was one of the last people off the roof of Saigon. Um, you saw the helicopter shot. Uh, I don't think that was actually the embassy, but they, a lot of people think it was the embassy. But he talks about getting on the helicopter 
um, after I think he had three tours in Vietnam. He was a fluent uh, Vietnamese speaker and he was an intelligence officer. And um, one of the things that he told me over a beer <laughs> um, was uh, he, he wanted to write a book and he wanted to call it The Asian Smiled. And um, actually when he wrote the book later, uh, he had to change the name because it, it looked like a stereotype. Um, the, the publisher didn't want to use that. But what he was saying was, when they go through villages, and this is during a, a time when they were actually um, doing what we do today, we take we assass basically assassinate the bad guys unless they turn. Operation Phoenix or Phoenix uh, Project. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. Um, but um, one of the things he said was, when you go through a village, the people behaved as if they were your friend. And they smiled and they offered you rice and the little food that they have, they, they would share. But at night, they'd put on black pajamas and they'd go out and slit your throat. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of stories like, like that in Vietnam. They're, they're the censors that we put along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, um, once they knew they were being censored, they changed their behavior very quickly to make it look like what confirmed what we wanted to see when that was movement when actually it was fake. They, they found ways to fake things, and they put bridges underwater, you know. So, they, so, so the, there's always a, a response back, if, if, if a behavior is being measured, there, there's the, the human, you know, the humans are crafty, and they, they figure out a way to say, okay, I'm being watched or I'm being measured, now I can come back and uh, show you what you want to see, but it's not really true. So, how do you, how do you address that. With some difficulties, <laughs> yeah. obviously. So the real way we're trying to look at it is we're collecting huge data sets and disparate data sets. So there's no one set of behaviors that they can change to bluffers or spoofers in that way. But also, really, we're trying to look at behaviors where they haven't yet moved that step beyond. So. It's going to be that we take a step, they take a step, reaction, counter reaction. Um, at the moment, we're at our initial reaction. When they do a counter reaction, even though they can spoof, they're not mimicking the behaviors perfectly. You know, there's going to be a different context to it, different ways of approaching it. It might happen in a different time frame, or there'd be precursor behaviors that we would then link in a pattern. Would be the dream if you got it to work. So, for example, the key behaviors in that example we'd like to spot would be them building an underwater bridge, things like that. So I don't deny it's difficult, but it's that wider set, that wider data collection to pull out the different threads. Chris has some questions on that. Uh, anybody have a verbal question before, or should we wait for that? No, whatever. <laughs> okay. Um, first question, how do you account for epistemological and ontological relativism in your project? Not directly, I think it's a fair answer. I mean, as I said, I didn't build the work around ontology or epistemology. Um, I'm now referring those concepts back to what we've done. But I mean, I accept it's relative to us. What we're trying to do is a framework that's open and flexible enough. I want to shy away from the word future proof but then we can account for these things that when we understand perhaps we were wrong on something or we just apply a very specific um, set of data or set of pattern, pattern recognition algorithms in one space, it won't transfer across. Um, so every solution should be bespoke, unique, um, and relative to that situation. It is not going to be a, we've got a capability, it will work against all problems equally, if at all. Um, I'm doing a project at the moment looking at military chaplaincy and new technology okay. and one of the things that's uh, talked about in one of the books I've read is about how technology um, affects the way that we use morality in the military um, and kind of bad teaching and stuff. But your point about chivalry kind of clicked in my head. I thought, ah, oh, he talks about chivalry too. So I wonder if you could expand that point a little bit more, um, if you can, because I found it really interesting. Okay. I think on that one, I was trying to use that as an example of how your role in society determines your ethics and your moral framework in which you operate. So in that case, I'm sorry you could 
you use as comparable, violence is permitted under circumstances, uh, under a set rule of context, that would not be applicable to somebody else who's not in that particular social role, because that would mean they're um, a serial killer, um, a vigilante, or something like that. So police can operate morally and ethically within their framework and their role. When they're not in that role, so if they're off duty, then they're less able or less free to operate in it. If you're not a police, you're not a soldier, then you just do not engage in those behaviours because it's immoral or not ethical for you to do so. Shout. It's just uh, helps with the recording. Okay. Thank you. Um, I had a I had a question about when you were talking about um, uh, from what I understood and, and correct me if I understood it wrong, kind of stripping the data down and taking the intersectionality out of it in order to identify patterns. Um, and I and I wanted to ask, um, do you sex disaggregate your data? Uh, because a lot of times that tells uh, and and with age markers that tells. Um, a huge, uh, a huge narrative that we can actually then leverage. So I just wondered if maybe you had talked about um, doing that, and then I'm referring to the slide where you had the picture of the Afghans, and you were talking about there's so many things that we could look at. Um, so could you talk maybe a little bit more about some of the logic behind that, or what your discussions are, or whatever? Thank you. Within that, it, I mean, the short answer is it depends. Um, and one of the problems we had, we did break it down by demographics, by gender, by education levels, by location employment. On another chart, probably we looked at, that was kind of irrelevant. It was purely role-based and how people acted through their different roles. So, yeah, I wouldn't want to say there's a, a particular way we would slice the data to plant certain characteristics. It depends on the actual data we've got, the problem we're trying to approach, and, the, and our way of approaching it, the hypothesis that the human sciences generate. Um, to your early point, I think the intersectionality isn't something we're trying to strip out. We want to be aware of the bias, but it's that intersectionality between different disparate databases that's adding the value. And it's because we're using different disparate databases, so some of my chair to spoofers, although they could spoof us <coughs> on one axis of behavior, the idea would be on different axis of behavior that we observe differently, we'd get data that suggests that's a spoof and we could mitigate accordingly. Um, any back there. In comparison, I have a dumb question. Okay. Um, I'm not clever enough to understand all these big words that have been used. Um, all this is great, and I love all the human behaviour stuff, and must have had to be good for it. But a lot of the problems that we've discussed already over the last one and a half days are actually about our internal behaviours. So actually, I understand the application of it in a you know conflict scenario. Is there any work going on to actually apply all the stuff we know about human behaviour and science and data collection to hold up the mirror back to us to prove to us why we're not actually getting anywhere in terms of culture change? Because a lot of the stuff could be applied internally and I just feel like we're not doing that. Thank you. The easy answer is yes. Um, so one of the data sets that we used was a limited cut of data from Obherrick and it was emails from the headquarters um, chat logs from the headquarters to try and identify how the patterns of behaviour responded to external events. Um, we could also look at that in a future event to look at how language indicates leadership positions separate to role positions. Uh, that's two specific examples of how we're trying to approach it. Um, elsewhere within DSTL, there's a lot of work going about, again, how we can be reflexive about this. In fact, even within DSTL, we're trying to be self reflexive, so bringing together a data based approach as well as ethnographic approaches. So, absolutely valid question, and we are trying to address them. Do you want me to make this up? I think we're about oh. ready. Oh, is it? It's a couple seconds here, I think. But uh, uh, please, uh, let's give James a round of applause. Thank you, Thank you James.